So uh, I'm going to turn this on, and, and can everyone, when this thing decides, okay, can everyone in the back hear me? All right, good. Uh, so the other confession I have, I told my wife this morning, I'm a little nervous today, uh, and I love to speak to groups, and so it's unusual for me to be nervous. <clears throat> she said, why are you nervous? And I said, well, I feel like I'm a first semester physics student trying to present on the theory of relativity to Einstein, considering the, 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 the smarts in prairies that we have in this room today. And I was asked to come talk about the value of prairie. And I'm like, do they really know who they asked to come up here and talk about this? So, so I'm a little nervous, but what I agreed to is to come and talk about kind of over my career. I work for, the, for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as the Wildlife Diversity Program Director, but I've come up through several jobs, and for about 15 years, I worked in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex <clears throat> as an urban biologist, and largely working with that mixed grass, blackland prairie up there. And so uh, over the course of that job, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, I came to understand the various ways that people view prairies. And so we talked about, you know, uh, maybe I could kind of present some of that. So I'm going to just also freely admit that uh, this is my perspective. There will be other people who have potentially uh, different perspectives, and that's okay. But we might not get to anyone's perspective if this doesn't work. And I, you know, I... <laughs> do I need to turn it on, Pete? It could be. Uh, it could be. <laughs> Let's see if that works. There we go. All right. So, so the other thing is this whole concept of trying to value uh, the prairie seems a little odd to me. Uh, it's kind of like trying to value the invaluable. And if I do my job correctly today, there will be some mental collisions happening in people's brains, okay? Might even, you might collide with someone sitting right next to you because as, as Jaime pointed out, although we're all prairie enthusiasts in here, uh, there's going to be some different perspectives, I would imagine. <clears throat> But what I wanted to do as I was starting to put all this together is, is I kept coming back mentally to this, to this thought process. Which is more important? Is it more important why a prairie is valued or simply that prairie is valued? And I would submit over my career, my perspective is the second one. It doesn't matter necessarily to me if someone I'm talking to has a completely different reason why they want this prairie to remain, as long as we can kind of come to a central uh, uh, agreement that it's a good thing for that prairie uh, to remain. And so as I thought about this, I always put a theme up there. So there are many ways to value prairies. I would submit to you none is incorrect. Um, I happen to agree more with some value uh, systems than others, but I want to kind of just explore um, all the different ways that people value prairies and why prairies matter, the so what, why should we be concerned about them, and why are they uh, important. And so there are four things we're going to cover through the course of, of my talk. We're going to talk a little bit about value judgments. We're going to talk about what they are, how they influence, how people see things, and we're going to do a little activity. Uh, then we're going to talk about the psychological, social, kind of intrinsic value of prairies. And then we're going to get into the ecological value and then finally the economic value. But first of all, as I mentioned, my career, uh, I kind of spent a lot of years as an urban biologist up in the Dallas area working with communities, working with cities, working with nonprofits, working with corporations and schools, etc. And constantly began to kind of run into this, this concept of people valuing things for different reasons than I do. And I had to, you know, Rob Dankhouse sitting right over here is a good friend of mine from the Dallas area, uh, from Fort Worth, excuse me, not the Dallas area, he's from Fort Worth. I don't want to confuse those. Um, <laughs> those of you that are from the Dallas area get that, uh, that, that dichotomy. But um, 
One of the things that, that we've often talked about is the fact that you have to kind of be a chameleon when you're a conservationist trying to work with all these different interests and trying to find a way to pitch the message such that it resonates with the person uh, that you're speaking to. And so through this particular job, I learned a lot about value systems and a lot about what words mean. And so to me, when I would be talking to a park manager or something, and I would say, you know, we do do, do a prairie restoration here. They're <laughs> nodding their head, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is what it might mean to me. But what I began to learn is as I would talk about prairies to different people, and you know, I'd be, maybe there'd be somebody that'd be in the neighborhood near, nearby would say, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do a prairie restoration here. Well, in their mind, it might mean this. Somebody tell me what this is. Johnson grass. This is not what I'm talking about when I say prairie. It's tall grass, you know, but some people, you know, when you say prairie, they think that, and they're like, oh, no, no, we're not doing that. And so that's, that's the way I react to this. Others may go, yes, I like prairie. This is good. <laughs> Lots of grass. I like that. So, so, you know, you really have to understand perspectives and understand where people are coming from and what words mean to other people. So uh, everybody has a different perspective based upon their value judgments. And so what I want to ask now, it, and I forgot to mention, oftentimes these judgments are snap judgments. Now I know most people in the room here are saying, not me, I think about things first before I decide how I feel. And you would be lying to yourself if that's what you said. Because everyone makes snap judgments every day. You made a snap judgment about me when I walked up here. I, you know, it's just that's the way it happens, human nature. So oftentimes, our projects that we're putting on the ground are being judged by people at a stoplight that happen to look out the window and see this project. And what's going on in their head is these tapes that tell them whether or not they like that. And so we have to understand that. We have to kind of be okay with that. And so these judgments are snap judgments. So now what I'm gonna do is a little exercise, trying to kind of once again use what Jaime started off with, uh, getting a, 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 some sort of a feel for the diversity that we have in the room. What is your perspective? I'm gonna show you some images. I'm gonna ask you if it's okay with you or not okay with you, and either answer is okay. All right, quick, quick snap judgment. You ready? Is this okay, is this not okay? Raise your hand if this is okay with you. It's fine, we got some people back there, say so it's okay, all right? Is this not okay with you? Most people say not okay. Now, <clears throat> so if you're willing, somebody tell me, if, if this is okay with you, tell me why. It's okay. Why is this okay? If two consenting adults interact, it's okay. For those of you... For those of you that didn't hear, she said there are two consenting adults. If they're okay with it, she's okay with it. That's probably the funniest answer I've ever heard about. <laughs> now, if this is not okay to you, someone tell me why. Somebody just, why is this not okay to you? Rabies is a possibility. All right. I'm not going to tell you which the answer is. There's not a correct answer. We're going to move on. I just wanted to make sure. Some people say it's okay. Some say it's not okay. Is this okay to you? Raise your hand if this is okay to you. Okay. Raise your hand if this is not okay to you. A couple of people. And everybody says, I need more information. I hear that. I'm listening to what y'all are saying. But the reality is your brain says no, it's either okay or not. So somebody tell me, why is this okay with you if it is okay with you? Yes, sir. Uh, the fire's not laddering up. It looks like, you know, there's a lot of, or very little fuel, kind of cool fire. Hopefully so you understand a lot about fire. You look at this and you immediately say, okay, there's a lot of things going on here. I think it's a good thing. I don't see any sign that it's crowning, I, you know, all those kinds of issues. Now, someone who doesn't like this or said it's not okay, would you be willing to tell me why? I think in the back of the room. Yes. Uh huh. Um, again, I'm not an expert on fire, but that, to me, tells me run for your life. Run for your life. That's exactly right. Uh, typically, if you see fire and you don't run for your life, you, maybe you have to know an awful lot about fire to know when to run and when not to run. So we see the same picture. Is this okay? Not okay. How many of you say this is okay? Sure, no, surely, come on now. There's, I, I see some people that are hiding their hands just to let you know. We're not judgmental in this room. I'm just saying, we're all friends. Some say this is okay. So I, I assume most of you say this is not, right? So nevertheless, 
there's a, some beautiful homes there and we have people in the room say that's not okay. Is this okay? Is this not okay? Raise this hand, raise your hand if this is okay. All right, raise your hand if it's not okay. See? <clears throat> what about this? Raise your hand if this is okay with you. What if this is not okay with you? Raise your hand. All right, good. You see, we get a diversity of opinion here. How about this one? Is this okay? Raise your hand if this is okay. All right, a couple. Raise your hand if this is not okay. Okay. You see, it's fascinating to me because I get to watch all the faces and I get to see, I put these images together so I know how I feel about them and I know all the backstory, but it's interesting to me because people make snap judgments and we decide whether this is okay or not okay. Is this okay with you? Raise your hand. All right. Is this not okay with you? Raise your hand. Okay, now I'm going to come on camp on this one. <laughs> so if this is okay with you, somebody tell me why if you don't mind. Yes? It's people valuing the wild wildlife. People love to be out there. They're showing a connection to that landscape. People love it. They're taking pictures. And that is a good thing. Absolutely. Now, if you don't think this is okay, someone please offer for me why. Yes? Ah, it is uh, because you're talking about uh, the humans or the, or the blue bottle. <laughs> so you're looking at this and saying that's not a healthy system. And so that's why that's not okay to you. See, these are, these are, these are things I love about these kinds of images and the snap judgments and the perspectives that we have. Is this okay or not okay? How many say it's okay? How many say not okay? All right, okay. What about this one? I think this is the last one. Is this okay with you? Raise your hand if this is okay. Raise your hand if it is not okay. <clears throat> Y'all have all onto this now. You're like, I'm not voting. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> See, I'm watching you. The reason I put all of this up here is just simply to say exactly what Jaime said. You're probably not going to find many more people in a room this size to find this many people who are kindred spirits about prairies, right? So you would think that we think very much alike. The reality is, even in this room, our value judgments and our perspectives can be widely different. And so I just say all of that to say, now when we go through all of these values, you may find some of these values that you identify with very strongly, and you may find other values that people identify with to be offensive to you. And that's okay. We're just going to talk about this and move through it. So we're going to talk first about the psychological value, the social value, or the intrinsic value of prairies. And these are just things that, that you know, I've either found in the literature or, <clears throat> or have experienced myself or have, have had someone tell me this is why they value things. But, uh, you know, the, the first value about natural systems is that people use them to kind of refresh their batteries or restore their batteries. And, you know, the quote from John Burroughs there saying, I go to nature to be soothed, healed, and have my senses put back in tune again. And this has been actually um, uh, demonstrated in research. There was a study done in the 80s uh, trying to determine sounds that humans preferred the most. What do you think those are? Raise your hand if you want to holler out an answer. Birds. We got to vote for birds. I heard some others. Running water. Running water. Any other guesses? Crickets. Crickets. Surf. Leaves. Wind in the leaves. Or leaves in the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So y'all got it. Uh, the top three. Number one, birds singing. Number two, moving water. Number three, wind. Now, what do you think are the least preferred sounds? For those of you that have not heard this research, what do you think are the least preferred? Airplanes over your house, that's a pretty bad sound. Construction. Freeway traffic. Okay. Nobody said the dog next door. That would be the, you know, the, my neighbor's dog is, uh, is driving me crazy right now. So you pretty much got it. Traffic, sirens, and gunfire. And depending upon the situation, those may all three go together. Uh, <clears throat> but traffic, gunfire, and then sirens uh, typically is the way that works. But uh, yeah, these are, these are these urban sounds. These are these non-natural sounds. And so it's been well documented in the research that natural areas reduce stress on human beings. And in fact, hospitals and recovery centers and um, 
uh, different care facilities where you put, uh, you know, different people who need long-term care. They've all understood this now, that natural views outside windows, natural places for people to go and sit, natural decorations in the hallways all help psychologically and mentally uh, for people to heal. And MD Anderson, do we have somebody here from MD Anderson today? Okay, uh, I drove past there, uh, come in here. So again, saw this site again. This is uh, uh, not, this issue is not lost on MD Anderson and some of the things that they're doing to, uh, to, to naturalize their facility. Uh, corporations are getting very much into this. They understand this research. Employee satisfaction is higher when corporations maintain natural areas on the corporate grounds. Uh, this is Fidelity up in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. You can see that their corporate grounds are not uh, manicured like many corporate grounds you might see elsewhere. I wouldn't necessarily say this is the healthiest of the prairies, but nevertheless, um, an interesting step forward. So, uh, and we've also determined that <clears throat> crime will decrease as green increases. Now, admittedly, a lot of these particular kinds of studies are tree-centric, but nevertheless, um, as the open space and as natural open space increases in a community, they can track the crime rate uh, going down depending upon uh, where you are. There's also <clears throat> the passive or recreational value of the prairie. Uh, I know for me, one of my favorite things uh, whenever I take a camera out is it, it's very approachable to be in a prairie. It's very human scale. And what I like to do is I like to go out into the prairie and I like to be still for about 10 minutes and then really look around because everything that, that, that gets disturbed when you walk in there, everything hides. But if you sit there for a while, you'll start to see things come out and stuff starts to live again. And, and then you can get some you know, really interesting things happening right at, the, right at your eye level when you're sitting down in, in a prairie or even standing in a prairie with some of the tall grasses. But so very, very good opportunities for photography and for wildlife watching uh, as, as uh, uh, prairies are being valued in different ways. So there's also the food and medicinal value, the, uh, the ethnobotany kind of uh, uh, discipline. There are over a thousand species I have seen that have been documented to be consumed. Uh, these are prairie plants that people uh, use to, um, to actually uh, you know, keep themselves alive. And then there are currently over a hundred species being researched in uh, their medicinal values at, there at the University of Kansas. They've got a, kind of a whole prairie pharmaceutical research um, uh, program going on. So uh, really, really neat stuff is happening there. But you have to also admit there are those who value prairies for what they are not. I mean, it's the truth. If it's not development, believe it or not, that's a value. Uh, valuing it for something uh, that it's not. So that's just a psychological, again, psychological value. So these last two are hard to tease apart because ecological values have an economic price tag and, you know, and, and all kinds of things like that. So, so I put them uh, in separate categories, but, but you have to kind of understand that they really kind of go together in many ways. Ecological value to many in this room is probably um, the, the inherent value that, that brings you to this conference. <clears throat> and I would, I would tend to agree with you and one of the things I think that is, that is critical that, that, that I have to say up front is one of the things that makes this, this particular landscape so valuable ecologically is, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of it left. It depends on what kind of prairie you're talking about and, and what kind of boundaries you put on your, your statistics, but it's somewhere between 1% and 3% is all that's left. And so what's left is supremely valuable uh, because it is um, um, kind of a, an echo of what once was a vast... Um, ecosystem. And so, uh, how many of you know Jim Edson? Jim's not here today, is he? Did he sign up? He's not here today? All right, several of you know Jim Edson. Jim, uh, Jim was kind of, uh, you know, not kind of, Jim was a mentor introducing me to the prairie uh, when I was up there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. <clears throat> and it's easy to say, you know, oh, there's 99% you know, of it's gone, and then that number just kind of <laughs> washes over. But one of the things that when Jim and I were walking around up there at Climber Meadow, one of the things that, that kept hitting me between the eyes is when he showed me Gilgai. Y'all know what Gilgai are? We're going to talk a little bit about that. But when he showed me what Gilgai are and I saw it on the ground, what hit me was um, not just the statistic of what had been lost, 
but the reality of what had been lost. So I want to, I want to camp out on Gilgai for just a second and just kind of, kind of imagine some things, if you will allow me. But you see up here the, uh, the, the golf ball surface uh, uh, that it looks like on the surface of this prairie are all of these Gilgai. <clears throat> and this is a very crudely drawn um, uh, illustration of, of Gilgai formation processes, etc. But what I really want you to see is I want you to see that this is kind of a, a, a cross-section of a Gilgai. This might be somewhere around 10 feet across. It might be 16 inches deep. Uh, but you notice, even within this, uh, this small area here, there's a lot of uh, microhabitat or micro topography, as they call it. And you have species that will grow down here. This is A, B, and C. This is eastern gamma grass, prairie rose, and spike rush will grow down in the bottoms of these. Whereas you have the blue stems that, and the side oats gramas that will grow up on the ridges. And so within just a few feet, you'll have completely different microhabitats. And that will create this um, uh, really, really diverse kind of system. This is a prairie up in the Dallas area in a town called Saxe, and this is March of 2005. If you look in March of 2015, this is that site. And so when you look at, look at all the Gilgai, and now all of that's gone. And so I happen to be a herper kind of in, at heart. Uh, that's what I kind of grew up doing. And so when you start looking at the, 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 just, just the issue of losing Gilgai, and I don't understand it again. Here I am, just a physics student, trying to explain theory relativity to Einstein's here and there in the room. But you look at some of the, the, depending upon the site, you can have about 200 of these per acre, and that's variable according to the site and the size of individuals. But these things retain water, they increase infiltration, they increase recharge, they prevent sheet runoff, they increase biodiversity, do all these great things. But this is what hit me. When I was walking around with Jim, I began to think, oh my gosh, think of the breeding sites that were lost. Again, this is, once again, I'm just one person telling you my perspective. Because I happen to be kind of into herbs. And so if you look at the, at the effect of losing Gilgai, you might look at a couple of these species. The one at the top is, uh, <clears throat> is a crawfish frog. Uh, it uses uh, mostly abandoned crawfish burrows. It's a species of greatest conservation need. We call it SGCN in the Texas Conservation Action Plan. So you can tell this particular species likes to be, especially, it's, it's not only found there, but it really likes to be in those moist uh, environments. And, and when you have Gilgai all over the place, you have lots of habitat for these guys. Uh, when you lose those, you begin to lose habitat. But here's the interesting one to me. This is spotted chorus frog. It breeds in ephemeral pools, but it's adaptable, so we still consider it common. It's on the landscape. It's not an SGCN. But my question is, is it really still common? How many of them were there before we lost all those Gilgai and all of those breeding sites for that particular frog? Were they on the landscape so thick you couldn't hear yourself think? They're still around, we still consider them common, but what have we lost? And, and, and so those are the thoughts that began to make me kind of stagger when Jim was talking about all this stuff. I was like, wow, I, I really don't even know. Maybe somebody in the room knows that answer, uh, but I, I don't. And it just kind of uh, um, uh, makes you just stop and blink for a few minutes. Uh, but when you also look at some ecological um, uh, value of prairies, you can talk about air quality and what prairies do for us. Uh, you look at the carbon sequestration as, as you compare prairie to croplands, and you can see that more carbon is sequestered uh, on a prairie than is on an agricultural piece of property. Uh, there are some studies that have demonstrated restored prairie sequesters about 428 pounds of carbon. Some of those uh, different studies and some of the same ones that did this also have ranges of about 623 to over 2,000 pounds of carbon on a native prairie site. And so the average of about uh, this particular range here is around about uh, you know, 1,000 pounds of carbon uh, per acre per year can be sequestered with a, a native uh, prairie system. But it's not only the carbon in the, lands, in the air that, that causes problems, it's also particulate matter. And so you can see that prairie grasses near a roadway have been shown to reduce the particulate matter generated by that roadway by 35%. And this whole removal of particulate matter is something that people are using uh, in, in creative ways, uh, putting prairies in places where prairies were never before. This is on top of the Chicago City Hall. So they're putting prairies up here and they've determined that the, the, the grasses and forbs on these landscapes uh, remove two kilograms of particulate matter per 10 square meters of surface area, and I'm assuming that's per year. 
Uh, but still, uh, a prairie being used in a, in a novel way uh, to accomplish some ecosystem services. But air quality is not the only ecological service or ecological value we can get out of prairies. We also see a lot of value to what we do with water, uh, water issues, water quality and water quantity. But first, water quality. <clears throat> Various studies have shown that tall native perennial grasses are superb, superb at trapping sediment. And this is being put to use uh, in prairie filter strips. You can see, uh, if you look very carefully, here is the filter strip going from here to about right here, and it kind of curves all the way around. Uh, so a 30-foot prairie filter strip on a 7% slope removes 95 or more percent of the sediment from the runoff. So they're very, very good at removing sediment and cleaning the sediment from the water, also good at cleaning nutrients out of the water. Coastal prairie wetlands are known to retain about 80% of the nitrogen that, nitrogen that enters the system and about 75% of the, uh, the potassium, that, the phosphorus that enters the system. But not only that, you go, now you move to the, to the tall grass prairies and nitrogen can be taken from the environment, whether it's out of the water or the air, and then can be shifted and put into the soil so that the prairie is actually improving the health of the soil over time. Uh, and you can see here, one of the studies said it transfers up to 33 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year and, and puts it into the soil. It also helps not only with quality, but quantity. We've had a lot of rain lately, um, and I can't help but think uh, there are things that we're doing that's causing a lot of the problems. Uh, and if you look at this particular slide, it talks about um, the, the different uh, hydrology as water hits in, in an undeveloped uh, uh, landscape versus a developed landscape and what happens. And how many of you know about flashiness of streams? When you urbanize, what happens to a stream? It reacts really quickly to a storm and then it goes down below its original level. So very, very flashy and unstable. And prairies uh, work to eliminate that flashiness, not only in streams, but in the soil itself. So for soil moisture, the flashiness is removed or stabilized, dampered by uh, prairies. You can see that they, uh, they retain soil moisture during a drought and absorbs runoff quickly during a rainfall and there is Plenty of evidence to, um, to point this out. The way that they do that are these extensive root systems uh, that many of you are well acquainted with that uh, are, are just simply kind of staggering to look at all the biomass under the ground. But there have been various studies that have demonstrated land containing these fibrous rooting plants absorbs runoff 127% faster than bare ground. Uh, another way to say that is runoff from native prairie catchments is 70% less uh, than that of cropland. But then uh, not only during the, the storm event, but during drought event, um, the, the moisture in the soil is lost at a much slower rate when you have native prairie on the landscape than when you have cropland, for example. And that could be uh, for many different reasons, uh, being shaded and then also having the mulch layers and, and things like that. But, uh, uh, but it, it nevertheless is a very stabilizing uh, factor. So again, it's hard to tease out ecological value and economic values. They're tied together, but I tried to do some of that. Uh, I am going to just admit a lot of those uh, ecological services that I just talked about have a cumulative uh, economic value, and I'm not going to go into all of that and, and start trying to quantify that, but I wanted to go a different direction with the economics of prairies. One of the things I wanted to talk about is this whole idea that prairie restoration can save money. Again, if you're talking to a park manager and that park manager is maintaining a piece of property, mowing the property, watering the property, fertilizing the property, the message that you can go to them is, hey, this will save you some money. There are some sources that I found that said you might have a return of investment at break even point at somewhere around three to seven years, depending upon your seed mix, et cetera. And then after that, you're saving a lot of money. Uh, by not having to maintain that in the, uh, in the way that you have maintained it before. And that particular message works a lot on certain clientele that have a different value system uh, uh, than, than perhaps some of us in the room. But even beyond that, <clears throat> if you look just at property values and the impact or the influence of having uh, prairie landscapes or, or even other open spaces, so a lot of this research is open space uh, generically, and it doesn't necessarily matter if it's trees or prairie, it might have a little bit of an influence on it, but the, what matters is that it is natural open space. Um, if you look, <clears throat> this is Columbus, Ohio, properties facing natural open space, we're up to 23% increase in the property values. Similar properties a block away sold for less on average. Um, 
and then properties facing intensively used open space, a playground or something like that, also had a depressing uh, effect on the, uh, the property values. And so it's really this natural open space that seems to be uh, getting the bump. Uh, you found similar things here in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, properties uh, adjacent to green belts were worth more. A linear relationship and a decline away from that green belt uh, in a decrease of property values. And then here's the interesting part, additional tax revenue of $500,000 annually just from one neighborhood being next to that open space. So that's real economic value. Such that, that many municipalities are, are doing these cost benefits, benefit analyses. Should we put the swamp here or not? Um, what they found is <clears throat> residential um, cost more to the municipality than brings in. So it's about $1.14 in services required to maintain a residential area per $1 of revenue. Commercial uh, get, costs about 43 cents for every dollar in revenue. Open space in this particular instance was 42 cents uh, of cost for every dollar of revenue. Now this has been replicated in many different places with uh, slightly different numbers, but still the, 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 um, the pattern holds up. There were six towns studied by American Farmland Trust. They found this very similar residential is $1.13 in services for a dollar revenue, open space being only 29 cents in cost per dollar revenue. So it's, it's, it's not entirely um, um, out of the question for a city to consider buying a piece of property because it's cheaper to do that than it is to allow that property to be developed. Here's a case, it was 1,250 acres. They looked at just outright purchasing that and what it would cost would raise the tax of the individual person at $4.25. Cost if they allowed it to be developed in single family residential was gonna be 328,000 and change a year, resulting in a tax increase of $7.75. They did the numbers, they bought the piece of property. So it made sense, made financial sense. And this all goes back to how you weigh um, you know, municipal budgeting, because a lot of this would, may, might lead someone to say, well then why don't we just have cities buy up all the open space? And they're, you know, it, that's, that seems to be what some of the data is saying. But it has to be a balancing act. You have to have essentially the money makers equal the money losers in, in municip municipal funding. And so you have to have, if you've ever listened to, uh, do we have any developers in the room? I'm, I'm curious. Anybody that does developing? Well, I, I've actually talked to developers in my, in my previous job, and I, I had a developer tell a city council member uh, just over and over again, it's about rooftops, 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 you need rooftops. And that was the hard sell. That's not entirely accurate. It's not entirely accurate that you don't need rooftops either, but it's not just houses, but if all you have is houses, you have a, mun a municipal budget that's in trouble. You have to balance that with open space and some commercial, and you have to know kind of what's going on if a municipality is going to develop. Now, uh, I saw that there were some people in the room today that are not from cities, but I'm gonna tell you, uh, we're in Houston, <laughs> and so uh, all this area around here has tremendous development pressure. So if for a minute we just allow ourselves to kind of live in that universe, and, and having cities not develop is not really an option. You really have to go in understanding this kind of formula if you're gonna be working with community leaders and talking to them about uh, you know, conserving prairie. Uh, although, it doesn't have to be an either, either or. How many of you know who Randall Arendt is? Raise your hand if you've heard of Randall Arendt. You know some of his work. Okay, he has a book called Conservation Design for Subdivisions. Again, this is a value system not everybody's gonna agree with. It's a value system that some people agree with. <clears throat> what he does, this is an example from his book, is he says, it is possible to actually develop a piece of property and try to keep the highest quality ecological functionality still on that piece of property while making money at a higher rate than before. And I'll explain. This is White Oak Farm. This is a real example that's been put on the ground. This particular set example, this is the way that property could have been platted. This was according to the subdivision regulations. It was, I think, two acre zoning. I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly, but it could have been laid out like this. And so, so Randall says, lay it out like it's supposed to be. That, that'd be 32 homes, okay. So he says, I could build 32 homes on there. Now let's look at what that property wants. He says, first of all, let's, let's talk about primary conservation areas. These are areas that, that, that legally you would have to get a permit to build upon. He says it's steep slopes, it's hydric soils, it's those kinds of things. He said, why don't we just take those and just move them off the table for now? 
we're not even going to consider developing there. Let's see if we can make it work without even touching those because now we don't have to get permits. Now we don't have to deal with that. Now, you know, all those kinds of things. He says, but let's go a step further. In this particular example, you notice that says wildflower meadow. For this group, let's assume that's native relic prairie. Okay? You also notice there's an old farmhouse here. Maybe this is the Johnson place, and the Johnsons grazed this and plowed this, but they didn't, they had a little hay meadow there that, you know, they, they, they just didn't do anything but with it. And so it's for, you know, 200 years it's been there. Y'all have seen properties like that. And so, you know, maybe, maybe these are secondary conservation areas that we should consider not developing if we can come up with a plan that develops this property while maintaining those things uh, in perpetuity. So this is what he does. He says, let's take the secondary conservation areas and then let's, let's exclude all of that and, and look at what is the most logical place for me as a developer to put homes. And then let's cluster the homes. And let's put them in a place where people want to live. He said, he's a landscape architect. He says, people buy homes. They don't buy lots, although that's what they do. They're, they're emotionally buying a home. They see themselves sitting on the back porch looking on something or whatever. So he said, make sure you, you position your home so that that maximizes that benefit. It's still 32 homes, so the developer's still getting all the homes, yet all lots now are premium lots because they're backing up to this open space. And then you, because you're clustering homes, you're minimizing roads, you're minimizing water lines, you're minimizing electric lines, and so it's actually saving the developer money. And when you're finished, you have a piece of property that uh, was developed and that saved the ecological functionality of that particular site. Again, maybe not a, a value system that many of us in here would share, but nevertheless, this will be appealing to some of the audience uh, that we uh, will be working with. And so then, th this particular idea has been catching on, and so, so there have been research studies that have looked at the appreciation rates for conservation development and the, and the benefit to municipalities. And so a study was done up in Massachusetts where conservation development market was, uh, was analyzed um, and compared to the average market appreciation in that particular area. And they found that conservation developments were appreciating at a higher rate than the average market value. Uh, and in fact, the appreciation rate for conservation developments was significantly higher than large lot development. So had they gone in with the two acre homes, the appreciation rate would have been significantly lower than what, what was there uh, in the end, having done the conservation development. And so once we put all these things together and we understand the values, the ecological values, the economic values, and we create a community that, that, that respects our local ecosystems, and we have a good quality of life, what we see, uh, whether for good or for bad, is we see that that quality of life is what, what businesses want for their employees. And so it actually works to the economic um, uh, environment's advantage to ensure that we have all of these things uh, healthy and working well. So we've looked at all the different ways that people can make value judgments on any number of issues or any number of things. We've, we've talked about the psychological or the intrinsic value of prairies. We've talked about the ecological value of prairies. We've talked about the economic value of prairies. And we've talked about all the people that can have any of these particular kinds of value systems at work at any one time. And I go back to the question that we talked about or we addressed early on, which is more valuable? why someone cares about a prairie or that someone cares about a prairie. And, and again, I submit it is more important that that someone cares about a prairie than specifically why. But I want to leave you with this particular thought and this particular individual. If you don't know any of Ian McCarg's work, uh, I suggest you go out and get the book Design with Nature. <clears throat> He's the father of modern ecological land use planning. In fact, if you know and use GIS, he is one of the ones that pioneered that technology. And so you owe anything you're doing in GIS to this guy, right? Uh, and one of the things that he did in one of the, his, the quotes that I think is, is best is that, you know, there are a lot of people out there that will care about something because it's right. A lot of us in here probably care about the prairie and the best you can say when you really get down to it is because it's the right thing to do. It's prairies, for goodness sakes. Why wouldn't you care? So it's a heart thing, right? And there are other people who may be in the room, and if they're not in the room, they're certainly out in our landscapes and our communities where we're going to be working that will say, you know what, I, I really kind of care about profit. I'm just going to be honest. Care about profit, right? The good news is 
the prairie gives us the opportunity to live in both camps and according to Ian McCarg, nothing beats the combination of righteousness <laughs> and profit. I want to thank uh, Sean Fitzgerald. If you have seen pictures up here uh, that have wowed you like they did me, uh, they're his photos. Sean, would you stand up in the back of the room? He's been very kind to let me borrow a whole bunch of his pictures, and I, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, he and I have been emailing back and forth, and apparently uh, uh, he has, uh, he kind of likes Climber Meadow. Is that fair? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So he's been really good to me and let me use some of these amazing uh, uh, photographs. But my name's John Davis. I'm, I'm probably running sh short on time. I don't know, do we do questions? Jaime, do you want to do questions? Or I don't know. Again, I'm just the first year physics student trying to answer questions from Einstein. But uh, are there any questions that y'all might have that I can try to answer? Yes, sir. With respect to your question, you know, having the two statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the question is of the two. Why is something important versus that it is important? And that when you're working with someone and you're out on a site, uh, it, is important to, um, <clears throat> it is important to know why. I mean, you kind of have to know um, where that person is coming from so that you can pitch things. I used to, uh, when I was working in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, if I were sitting in a room full of people that dealt with stormwater, Guarantee you, I was quoting, boy, you know, Prairie, 127% disaster. It's going to get the water right in the ground. That's what's going to happen there. You bet. And, and they would listen to that. But if I were talking to some other group, if it were Audubon or whatever, I'd be talking about, boy, lots of birds, diversity of birds there. You know, so, yeah, you, you have to know. And the bottom line is, I, you know, I, I didn't really care why they cared about it as long as they did. But you, you do have to know that, and you have to be very sensitive um, um, to those motivations. Yes, sir. Yeah, he said, for those who didn't hear, he was a little disturbed because he seems to think I'm promoting urban sprawl. That was one of those collisions that I said was going to happen uh, because, because that toolbox works and that tool works in the toolbox some of the time, but I guarantee it's not going to work all the time. So, so you're right. There's a whole issue of, of densification versus sprawl and, you know, and what, what kind of impact does that have. And so uh, that gets way beyond. Uh, we can talk about that over some, you know, a, a beer maybe this evening. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you're right, it is one of those things you have to be concerned about sprawl. And so uh, we were talking earlier, I had lunch with some of my staff and, and, uh, and we were talking about from a community perspective, there are places where conservation development is the perfect tool, but not elsewhere. You know, and so it's just, it's just one tool among many. Good point, good point. I, I, I don't know. Does, does anyone else in the room know much more about carbon sequestration than I? Uh, I, I yes, sir. I can. would say it can, but especially in no-till agriculture. If you do a lot of tilling and plowing, you basically just fire the carbon into the soil. Well, that's, that's what I thought, because I grew up in corn country, and that was one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> we, am I about out of time? Do we need to take? Okay. I'm going to be here. Yeah, I'll be here tonight. I'll be here most of tomorrow.